really loved the, the opening that you did, Michael, where you had people stand up and say, I'm a maker or I'm a citizen scientist. I want to extend that um, and ask anyone, anyone in here, to define what a maker is. Does anybody have any? Seriously, I would love to hear an answer. Yeah. I mean, basically, anyone who self identifies as a maker and says, I'm part of this community and I make stuff, whatever that might be. So you run the Maker Education Initiative. You should know what a maker is. <laughs> uh, a maker is a human. Okay. So, I mean, I, we actually have a very broad definition of maker. We think humans are makers. That's what defines us as a, I mean, separates us in, in some ways from other species. But if I was going to get more specific, I would say a maker is somebody who um, learns and grows through making things and defines themselves that way. So. Anyone else want to take a shot? Uh, I would second Aubrey's definition, but I would say that there are, there are people who identify themselves as makers, and then there are people that have the potential to be makers. And between those two groups, I would say that encompasses all humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone want to try and identify a citizen scientist? Darlene? <laughs> it's also very broad. Um, Typically, a citizen scientist, the way I would define it, is somebody who is looking to advance an area of research, and maybe they're not trying to advance somebody else's research. It could be their personal quest and their own curiosity. That's a good answer. Anyone else? I, I mean, that wasn't to prove really that anyone's answer was right or wrong. It was more to say that these are really these words are some are something that we're all using, and we don't have a common definition. And I don't think we need one. I actually think there's real power in these diffuse definitions. And if you get right down to it, and Charlie, we were talking when we when we got in. You were talking about why you're doing this, and you want people to get out there and get their their hands on hands on the land and, and get a feel for what's happening with the earth. And I think when I talk to makers, it's the same. Same thing, you get at this kind of core sense of what it means to be human, that we should be creative or we should be curious. And so I, I personally, I love that these words are really diffuse and, and everybody uses them differently. But I think what this conference proves and what Darlene was saying earlier that makes so much sense is there's actually a lot of overlap between these two words and these two communities. And um, I want to kind of I've been thinking a lot about that for the past several years. And um, I'm going to kind of run through our story, the stories of people I've met and talked to, uh, and also some of the, the, the things we've learned and, and are kind of showing us where this is headed. So this is another word that, that I think is at the core of what we're talking about is amateur. And, I, and what I don't mean is you know, the person who does something poorly or you know, with contempt. I mean the person who does something for passion, for love, for something bigger than money or a job or fame. They do it because it's, it's core to their, their belief. So my own story starts f almost five years ago now. I met this guy named Eric Stackpole who told me this incredible story about this underwater cave in Northern California. There were rumors of gold in this underwater cave from the gold rush and a bunch of scuba divers and treasure hunters had gone and tried to find the cave and the gold and no one um, ever found it. But Eric had a really special idea. He wanted to build an underwater robot to explore this cave. This is an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, and it's an underwater drone. It's a, basically a camera attached to a tether and you can drive it around and see what it sees. And these things exist. They're commercially available. They're just $50,000, $100,000. Uh, Eric and I didn't have that kind of money. I was living in my car at the time. Eric was sleeping on a couch. So we started building one in his garage. The problem was we didn't know what we were doing, really. That thing didn't work. So we did what anybody would do at that point, is we asked the internet for help. And, and in particular, we started a website called openrov.com, and we invited anyone to comment on our designs, and give us feedback, and point us in, in new directions. Uh, and at first, it was just me and Eric on the forums, but slowly, we got more people giving us feedback and ideas. and and tips, and eventually the robot evolved to something that was working. Um, and we went to the cave, and we found the cave, and we went to the back, and we found this 
the water-filled pit, just as that story had described. And it went down, down, and we sent the robot in, and we found tens of millions of dollars of gold. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't find anything. <laughs> the, that story got in the New York Times, and we learned a whole lot, actually, in the process of building the robot, and we had a lot of fun. And one of the important things we did was we had created this kit that anybody else could build, this underwater robot kit. And there were all these people all over the world who heard our story and wanted one for themselves. So we did. What you do next, you put your project on Kickstarter. And we raised $100,000, which back in 2012 was a, a lot of money on Kickstarter. Nobody really kind of knew that that could be done. Um, I mean, other tech projects had done that, but for a kit citizen science project, it was, pretty, it was pretty cool. And then we had to actually make them. And so the boxes showed up, and it was too big for the garage, but we eventually grew. Um, and you know, ship these robots. And over the past, is this, what is one? So over the past three years, we've shipped over 3,000 of these kits to every corner of the globe. They've gone to Antarctica on the ice. They've been this a couple weeks ago. I got this from the Himalayas. Uh, they're studying glacial outburst flooding in the Himalayas. Schools in Oakland, communities in Papua New Guinea, people studying glass sponge reefs in Vancouver, creating 3D visualizations and models. We went to the wreck of the SS Tahoe a couple weeks ago. I'll, you know, I'll show you that video later. But we've grown as a company. You know, we have 10 people now working in this, shipping these robots all over the world. And, and we took all of those lessons and we designed it into an actual product. And so now this is what we have. This, you can barely see it. Um, <laughs> this is called the Trident. This is our latest model. And we did a Kickstarter project for this um, last year, raised $815,000, and we're getting ready to ship them in a couple months. It's pretty amazing. It really is pretty amazing that we went from two guys in the garage with, I mean, literally $200 between us uh, to this global community of DIY ocean explorers. Um, yeah, you know, I tell this story a lot, and it's, it's, still, it's still surprising. It's still kind of, I laugh and giggle every time that I tell the story. <laughs> um, but the coolest part about this is we're not, we're not alone. This is part of a, a much bigger thing that's, that's happening, and I think this community kind of epitomizes what that is. So citizen science. This is actually an old idea, and if you pick up the book in the back, they'll start by telling you that this is an old idea. And it is. So the birders are a good example. I mean, the Christmas bird count has been going on for over 100 years. The birders know how to, to involve non-professionals, people who do this for the pursuit of joy and um, interest over just publishing papers. Um, they've incorporated them in their process. Astronomers, too. So this is a photo of, of John Dobson, who was the monk who dropped out of the monastery to build telescopes, created the Dobsonian telescope, started this sidewalk astronomers movement. It was really a, one of the driving forces for why astronomy has been such a, a democratized um, discipline. His story is really fascinating. You should Google John Dobson and, and read all about him, but he lived a really long, fascinating life. I thought this one kind of looked like Darlene. Um, <laughs> all right, Doesn't maybe it, it was. <laughs> but, so, I think there's a lot of lessons to what's, what's happened, and I think what, as we talk about citizen science, and I, I do agree with Darlene that we are right here, we're at the very beginning, and this is just, picking up is, is technology is making all of this go faster. And that's true for birding. You know, we have things like eBird and iNaturalist where people are actually coordinating together and um, pooling their data and changing the interface so more people can get involved. But it's, but it's also more than that. Um, it's all of these new maker tools. And this is so cool that we're actually in a tech shop but, so you can go and see all of these things that are going on, but all of those sensors that are in the phone, the miniature Linux computers, the cameras, the accelerometers, the gyroscopes, all of those things have become really cheap building blocks. And that's why you've seen this explosion in drones. That's why you've seen everybody creating connected light bulbs and doing all these things. And now that same kind of idea is being applied 
to scientific instruments. So we had access to that shot. Um, I had kind of the, begged my way into getting a membership at Tech Shop um, when we were getting started. And that's the only reason that we had the tools, the laser cutter in particular, to prototype that first open ROV. And so that's something that all of these makers have access to, whether or not you have any money. And so there, this, people are taking this idea and expanding it beyond just birding and astronomy. This is a, a photo, this is actually the same garage that Eric and I started in. This is, these were his roommates. And they had this idea for building low cost Earth observation satellites. They wanted to take all the, the stuff that was going on in your phone and create a constellation of satellites to monitor the Earth. And they, they prototyped that first satellite in our garage. And um, now, they've since became a company, it's called Planet Labs, planet.com. And they have launched hundreds of these little satellites. They've raised hundreds of millions of dollars in capital, and they're getting an image of every location on Earth every day. They've, they've created the largest, one of the largest Earth observation networks in the world. Um, they're running a space program out of their office in San Francisco. And they, these were our roommates. This was happening in, across the garage from us. Um, I think that, that speaks to the power of this movement. Is that science? I don't know if it's science. But it's really a powerful new tool in how we're going to understand our planet. Um, there's some images they got of detecting an illegal gold mine. This is Topher, a friend of mine who took old broken cell phones and created this um, rainforest monitoring device, raised $250,000 on Kickstarter, and it's now running programs all over the world monitoring for illegal logging and biodiversity um, using old broken cell phones. It's not just a Silicon Valley story. I think that's really important to emphasize. I mean, there's people using DIY drones in Indonesia. There are these folded microscopes, these 50 cent um, <coughs> microscopes that people are using and, and exploring the microcosmos. Safecast, these, these, as soon as the, the nuclear reactor meltdown in Fukushima happened, these groups created their own DIY Geiger counter and went out and started me me measuring radiation because they were concerned. Um, now they have more radiation da data than any other nation state and they're getting it from all over the world every day. It's called Safecast. Um, there's a huge long list of tools that I, I've lost track of around DIY bio. So taking all of the expensive, expensive lab equipment it takes to run, um, to do biology research, and making those cheap, cheaper and more accessible. There's community bio labs that are popping up in the same way that maker spaces have, have been popping up all over the world. So have these DIY bio spaces, which are giving people access to labs who wouldn't necessarily be able to afford them. I mean, the list goes on and on, and it's really, it's starting to add up to something more than just individual stories. And it's tricky, right? Because not all of it is science. And, and I think that gets a lot of people hung up. When, if, if I were talking to a room full of scientists right now, which I think some of you are, they would go, well, the data is not reproducible, or the you know the, da the data. What? How many papers have been published? That I don't. Those things are coming, but right now, what's happening is a lot of this kind of stuff, where it's just curiosity, and I think that's I think that's okay for now. But this kind of a idea of the long tail. I mean, we talked about this happening. We've been using this analogy of this happening with the maker world, which all these tools became democratized and everybody had access to the means of production. But this also recently happened with journalism. You know, all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's, it's not just the New York Times. You have Twitter and BuzzFeed, and anybody can create their own publication. This happened with movies. All of a sudden, everybody can film things with their iPhone and post it on YouTube. And we wouldn't call these cat videos films, <laughs> but certainly it's something that's important, and it's growing, and it's, and it's changing the landscape of what's possible. And so I like to use this kind of graph to, to help make sense of this in my own mind, where amateur curiosity is booming. Traditional science, the NSF-funded, peer-reviewed stuff, they're, they're really resource-constrained. There's only so many of those jobs. There's only so many people. There's only so many 
peer reviewers to do that work. The amateur curiosity is booming. And I think citizen science is this really important interface between these two worlds. It translates that amateur curiosity into science, which is this, this accumulating body of knowledge that we share. And this, we've seen glimpses of what this, this world is, is going to become. I think um, a lot of the citizen science work, especially that you guys are doing the SciStarter and um, like the Cornell Lab, I think people are doing a really good job of trying to make sure, and, and adventure scientists, making sure that the data, that there's a lot of integrity. And there have been, I mean, Karen Cooper came out with a report last year around how, how many of these ornithology papers dealing with avian migration and climate change actually use citizen science data and didn't even comment on it. So we know that the data is actually good. But what we are also learning is that there's bigger implications. And that has to do around the, the community aspect and the storytelling and the way that we're engaging communities in the process of discovery. So this is Laura James. She's a member of our community. She lives in Seattle and loves Puget Sound. And she um, recently started building robots. And she noticed that the sea stars in her area were dying off. And so she started drawing attention to that. Um, and you know, was concerned, and scientists didn't know what was going on either. And so Laura decided to create this citizen science project called Six Sea Star, and basically on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, you just hashtag it. And then that data was then getting uploaded to the Pete Romani's work at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so she had created this, this method, this way for people to monitor for sea stars. And you know, was she collecting the most data? It wasn't huge amounts, but what she did do was stir up this big media blitz. So PBS did this whole documentary on her and her project, and that caught the eye of uh, one of the, the, the how, one, one of the people in the house from Washington who saw this story and thought, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And so he introduced the Marine, Emergency Marine Disease Act, and it's still you know, stuck in the house right now. But it, to me, this is, the, this is a, a perfect example of how citizen science closes that loop from something happening in the environment, scientists doing this research, the public actually participating, informing the media, helping to tell this bigger story, and then going back into legislation that can actually hopefully get, prevent this kind of thing from happening again. So it closes this loop. It helps take science out of that ivory tower of just researchers doing research and publishing papers that only they read. It brings everybody into the fold. And uh, the story that you'll read about in the book, if you haven't already read it, is what's going on in Flint. So a lot of people know that the, the Flint water crisis is, first of all, it's an ongoing disaster. But not a lot of people realize that that actually was a citizen science story. So the governor, or Professor Mark, Mark Edwards had a really hard time convincing anybody until he got the community. He gave them 300 kits to test their water and said, you guys organize this study. And they did, and they got activated, and they got organized, and they organized the Flint Water Study. And that was really the catalyst for all the attention that was driven. There was a really fantastic Wired article about this. Um, and they said, this type of citizen, citizen power and apocalypse averting science is spreading. And it listed a bunch of projects that all of us citizen scientists are familiar with. And then the, my favorite line, and I, I want to read this because it's so good. Researchers are learning that there's a difference between publishing results, actually, you know, getting them. <laughs> and I think that's the hope, that's the idea that we all share when we talk about citizen science, is that it's something we can participate in, that everybody can participate in. It's an ideal. But I, don't, but I actually don't think this, that's it. I think there's even more to the story. What we're doing is creating this, we're creating room for people to ask questions, and that's going to have implications beyond just storytelling and beyond just data. So the this is a, photos, a series of photos I got a couple years ago from this guy, Corey Tobin. And Corey was a, studying biotechnology at Caltech, brilliant guy. But he had this interesting idea about um, this specific soil in Germany that he had been tested, that he thought had microbes that were as fixing nitrogen to plants without um, Anyways, he thought this, 
this, these microbes could, could really solve a lot of problems that we face with um, fertilizer and runoff and things like that. And Caltech didn't want to fund the research. So what he did is he whipped up his own DIY biology lab in his, in his, um, in his apartment. And it was, you know, he's using a cooler and an Arduino, and he's running these experiments in his, in his apartment. And it actually turned out that it was interesting enough. He got through this kind of preliminary stuff in his apartment that the NSF got involved. There were five coordinating institutions like uh, Harvard and, and a few others. Um, this microbe kind of turned out to be a dead end, but it was this really interesting case of Corey working outside of the traditional system. Like he, he, if he had to do this at Caltech, he never would have got this off the ground. So this one didn't turn out to, to work, but it's possible that another one could. And so what we're doing is we're creating all of these different options. So all of these postdocs who you know, are stuck in these labs can actually have a, a different way to pursue their research. And I think that has far-reaching results. And now Corey is, he's created this lab in Los Angeles called the, it's called the lab. But it's a <laughs> DIY biology space and there's all of these you know, citizen scientists and professional um, researchers who are working outside the system and pursuing um, their research on their own terms. And I think that's really exciting. I mean, exciting. And we're at this phase where we're building this infrastructure. We're creating these networks. We're building online communities like SciStarter and Open Explorer. And we're all telling this story. And I think that's really, I think that's really important because it's going to take a generation, right? Like I think a kid now, if they wanted to be a performer, they wouldn't necessarily think they had to move to Hollywood to do it. They would start their own YouTube channel and they would have access to this global community. Creativity is in their hands. And I think what we're doing is building the infrastructure for the next generation of, of curious humans. I don't even want to say scientists. Curious humans to ask questions about their world, about themselves, and to go out and find those answers. Because that's what discovery is littered with, with people who were just pursuing their own interests and found something that changed the world. And so that's what I think we're doing now, is, is building the plumbing. And I look forward to doing this in five years and talking about all the amazing discoveries that have come from it. So thank you very much.